of all the people I know associated with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra involved in this centenary of Robert Shaw, for me, one of the greatest pleasures is to talk to you, Rick, because you are one of the last real protégés of Mr. Shaw, someone he saw from the very beginning of your career all the way through the real zenith of your the beginnings of your big professional life as an opera and concert singer. So thanks for taking a little time with us. Today. Sure, it's my pleasure. When do you first meet Mr. Shaw? So I was actually in high school the first time I sang, and they, they used to do a um, school concerts, and they would make a chorus from high school singers who had been recommended by their choral conductors and I was in a, a group and we did um, I remember we did the big fugue from from Meisterzinger and big big works and so that was the first time that I experienced him but I grew up he was a he was a he was a god in our house because my father was supposed to be in the Shaw Chorale as a last minute replacement and couldn't at the last minute because my parents had my first sister and so my father didn't go on tour he got a job and so it was a very meaningful thing when I became the soloist and even in the, even was in the chorus with him so I knew about him even from the very beginning so how did he first become aware of you and your growing talent as a young tenor so I went I auditioned to be in his first festival in France in 1988 and um, I had already already sung in the in the symphony chorus I was a member of the chorus and the first day I was in the chorus, the first rehearsal, I walked up during the break and introduced myself, and he didn't even look up. He just sort of <laughs> pretended I wasn't there. And then I went to France and uh, did the same thing, and again, he, 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 was, he, was, ignored you. he was busy. <laughs> and, um, but soon thereafter, I was, after France, I did my senior recital, and um, I had become friends with his wife, Caroline, and his son, Thomas. And Tom, Thomas was 11 or 12 at the time, and we were, we were playmates in France. And they asked me, they couldn't go to my senior recital as if they would go, but they asked me if I had a tape of it. And on their family vacation, they listened to my senior recital in the car. And because of that, my first year of graduate school, uh, he called and asked if I would send them a tape of the B minor mass because he needed a soloist for a very small chamber part in the second choir of the of the Ozana. And so I recorded the, the aria from the B minor mass and sent it to him and that sort of started the ball rolling. Now there comes in the next decade and going into the last 15 years of Mr. Shaw's professional life more and more activity in your own life as a professional opera and concert singer and you grow closer and closer to the orchestra and the chorus perform numerous times with them here and in Carnegie Hall, make more recordings. So clearly, Mr. Shaw at some point said, okay, Rick, you're, you're my guy. But he didn't call you Rick, did he? No. That first, <laughs> well, there was a, a year when we were recording, the, we were tele, um, recording for television the, the, the Messiah, and I was sitting next to his wife Caroline, and he wanted us to switch places, and he had no idea who I was. And so he said, just randomly, Kevin, switch places with Caroline. And I didn't pay attention because I wasn't Kevin. But he yelled loud enough eventually that I did switch places. And everyone started calling me Kevin. And they said, if, if he calls you Kevin, you're Kevin. <laughs> so and, for the rest of your life with Robert Shaw, you were yes, Kevin. Yes, in fact, <laughs> he called me in a rehearsal. He called me to talk to him. With, he was with someone, a friend of mine. And they asked me a question, and I answered the question. He said, okay, Kevin, go back to your seat. And as I was walking away, I heard him say to, the, to our, our mutual friend, what's his name again? And this was years after I was his soloist. So he, <laughs> after that, he was just completely confused. <laughs> You've performed many times with him, and I know many people talk about some of the magnetic qualities of what he was like as a conductor. But if you had to distill it into a few sentences, what, were the, what was the special thing about working with Mr. Shaw? Shaw had a way, with a cor if you were an individual or, an, or a chorus, he had a way of making you feel like you were either pleasing or displeasing the composer himself. It was an amazing feat. I've never met anyone who could do it, but he really did talk to you as if you weren't just disappointing him, you were disappointing Mozart himself. That Mozart had toiled away at a phrase and you weren't representing it correctly. And it could be very, it could be very much at his whim mm -hmm. when he did that. And he could make you feel like you were the greatest singer that ever lived or the worst singer that ever lived, whether you were singing f with him yourself 
or in a in a 200 person chorus it, it was it was unbelievable and he I have a, a video recording that he did at Carnegie Hall of him after I, we did Elijah and I sang the piano rehearsal for him and I finished and after a while he stopped conducting and he just put his head down and I finished singing and he said he said just just wonderful and it's a, maybe the greatest thing anyone ever did because he could do the opposite he never did that with me but I saw him do it to a lot of people <laughs> And it was, it was, he could make you feel horrible, but he could also make you feel better than he was. So you, you lived for the, him making you feel better, even if he made you feel worse for a while.